Good morning. Nice to see you all here this morning. This morning, I'm going to give a talk that I've titled, I Won't Say. So one thing that at least is certain to me, and I have a feeling it's certain to many of you, is that reality can be maddening to us. I mean, it can be wonderful. Last night, I went for a walk just as the Sunlight was actually vanishing, it was turning tonight, going around Lake Harriet, and it was really quite lovely. So we know reality can be lovely, but reality can also be very maddening, especially when we want it to be a certain way and it won't comply. <laughs> you know, so we either think we understand what's going on and then we, we're given a lesson and some humility, or we want it to be a certain way and it just doesn't happen. And in those moments, when our certainty seems to be pulled out from underneath us, we sense that there's a deep uncertainty to this. Especially when we want to be certain, <laughs> there's a deep uncertainty to this. We can't know for sure what this is. It doesn't look a particular way. There's a deep uncertainty to it. And that the big uncertainty, the big daddy of them all, is death. That's the big thing that hangs over our head that we're uncertain about. We might ask ourselves, what, what's going to happen when I die? Or we might ask, what will death be like? How will I deal with it? Or even, what is death? You think about those questions. If you've actually had those questions and you've tried to answer them, one thing that you discover is that they're unanswerable. They're just questions you can't answer. You think about what will happen when I die. Well, who knows? Who knows? What will happen when you die? Nobody knows the answer to that. But to me, that's a trick question. Because we go, oh, yeah, that's the big unanswerable question. Because we don't know what's going to happen to us when we eat a potato chip. <laughs> to be honest, you could choke on that potato chip. You have no idea. It could taste awful. It could taste delicious. But you don't know what's going to happen. You don't know what will happen to you when you walk through the door. Or even what's going to happen in the next second. We don't know. It's easier, however, for us to imagine what that experience is going to be like. And that's why we separate it from death. Death is harder for us to imagine. We ask ourselves, what will death be like? What's going to be like? That's the thing. We want to be able to compare some experience to what that's going to be like. But it's like everything else in that it's, it's like nothing else. It's just this. We spend our time trying to work those comparisons out. It reminds me of a poem, at least part of a poem, by... Uh, Laura Riding Jackson, and I know I recited this poem many years ago here in this Zendo, and the poem is called Death is Death, and she says, like this, like this, like nothing else, like nothing, a similarity without resemblance, like nothing, a similarity without resemblance. What will death be like? What is this like? How will I deal with it? How do you know? Or the question even, what is death? And if you've tried to figure that one out, about the best you can do is figure out in terms of negation. You can only say what death isn't. So death is hanging over us like Damocles' sword, whether we dwell on it or not. So we may not be going throughout our lives going thinking about death all the time, but there it is, hanging over our lives. It's that great uncertainty. And that uncertainty could be something that would drive you to religious practice, and you take up something like Buddhism. And we then take up this way, and we start encountering teachings, and we might tell ourselves, well, Buddhism, that's a way that we can overcome death. We can re achieve what might be called as a deathlessness. And, you know, I've heard people say that, 
in, in a particular context in a discussion about death where somebody said, well, Buddhism shows us, blah, 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 so there is no death. And we know the teaching of bondage and freedom that to ignore reality, we have this sense of existence and the sense of existence means that we're born and that we're going to die and that this is bondage and that freedom is to realize reality, to see through our usual ideas about existence, to actually see reality for what it is, to see that nothing is really born, nothing really dies, and that that is freedom and that we realize this through practice, right? We may encounter that teaching. But my question is, what's going on there? When we tell ourselves, well, Buddhism has helped me overcome death. It's put me to this deathless state. So somewhat recently, it's a few weeks ago now, we encountered a passage in Dainan Katagiri's book, Returning to Silence. And Dainan Katagiri is our senior teacher, is Norm Randolph and Steve Hagen's teacher, a teacher who brought Zen to Minneapolis. And there's this passage, I'll talk about it, but this isn't returning to silence. He says, through deeply practicing Zazen, you may say, I am ready to die anytime, anywhere. I tell myself I'm ready to die, but when I see the reality, the fact that it is I who am dying right now, my mind screams for help from Zazen, from Buddha, from Avalokiteshvara Bodhisattva, but nothing happens. Finally, there is nothing to do. Just sit zazen, that's all. And what really made that passage poignant to me is that Katagiri, of course, died of cancer. And though I don't know when this talk was, returning to silence or transcriptions of talks that Katagiri gave, or parts of talks, one can imagine that this is after he's been diagnosed with cancer. And so through deeply practicing Zazen, you may say, I'm ready to die anytime, anywhere. Talk to people, they, they tell me, I don't, death, I'm ready for it. You know, I have friends who tell me that, and it's, it doesn't concern me at all. And it may not, as I said, it may not be something we dwell about, but there it is, that uncertainty, that uncertainty hanging over our lives. But then when death is facing us directly, when it's looking us in the eye, so to speak, when the fact is that I am dying right now. Then as Katagiri says, my mind screams for help from Zazen. Help me Zazen, help me Buddha, help me Avalokiteshvara, Bodhisattva, and nothing happens because here you are. So then he says, finally, there's nothing to do. Just sit Zazen. That's all, that's all. And that's all there is to do because sitting zazen is just realizing this. That's what zazen is. It's just realizing this, realizing this, whatever this is. This is just this. It always shows up in different ways. But to do or say anything else misses the mark and can lead us astray, can lead others astray as well. And that includes death. That includes death. So anything that we're going to say or anything that we're going to think about, reality misses the mark, including death. Is death just doesn't get it right. Again, we ask yourself, what is death or who or what is dying or where did it come from? Where does it go? Whatever it is that we think might be dying. And when we grab hold of death as this, concept. It's the big, I wish I could remember the way somebody put it once. It was like the big grand finale, the big bahuha, the big, you know, and they had a whole bunch of bigs. <laughs> That's it. And there's death. So when we have that object, again, even if we're not looking right at it, it's still there, that uncertainty, it still becomes this object. It becomes death. And as any object, then it becomes our universe. A universe is death. Whatever shows up is the whole universe showing up as that object. And when we take hold of that object, that's our whole universe, whatever it is. And we can think of many examples of how that happens. But I always think of 
simple one for those of us who sit meditation practice. If you've been in a meditation sitting long enough, long enough that something starts to hurt or something starts to itch maybe. Itching is another good one. When I think about my knee, when I would sit the prolonged sitting and that pain in my knee, oh my God, that really hurts. Is that bell gonna ring? And then I would just start to be like, oh, my knee's throbbing. I mean, it's throbbing right now. Holy cow, it's really hurting. I shouldn't, oh my God, I can't believe this. That bell's gonna ring, right? I mean, I shouldn't move because I'm gonna be disturbing the meditation hall. So I just got to sit here, but oh, my knee. And then after a while, it's like, oh, my God, that is a white hot searing pain. I'm not going to make it. Come on, ring that bell. It's got to be, you know, and that's it. And you realize that the whole experience right there is that pain. You realize that. Or if it's something like an itch, I'm not going to scratch that. I'm not going to scratch that itch. I'm not going to scratch <laughs> And if it, the itch is your whole thing that you're attending to, the object, then the whole universe is that itch. Same thing with death. It's a mind object. We grab hold of it, suddenly our whole universe is death. That's the way it goes. That's the way mind objects are. And yet, what about after death then? If the whole universe is death, what about after death? How can you have after death, there's a whole universe? So is death the whole universe? This keeps going. We know that. This keeps going. Now, what is this? What is this? And we can't say. So as I was preparing this talk, I was once again reminded of, this is a, a topic I brought up in a number of other talks. So I thought I'd finally get to a source where this gets addressed. But it reminded me of a conversation between two, I would say, two great American theater directors of all things. And uh, one of those theater directors went on to become a theoretician of theater. In other words, he wrote theory about theater, about what performance is. But when he had, when he had been in his final group that he was a director of, it was an avant-garde theater group that never really became famous because it was avant-garde. <laughs> but in two of the people, in that theater company, went on to have very successful careers in theater. One of them is somebody named Bill Irwin. People have heard of Bill Irwin, but he's got a background in clowning. He's an actor. He's been in some movies, been in a lot of theater, won a Tony Award for a revival of whatever, or uh, Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf, sorry. And Julie Taymor is the other person. And she's probably even the more famous of the two, though you may not know her name. You've probably seen one of her theater productions because she's a person who created the stage production of The Lion King. And she works with puppets and she often creates these astonishing stage spectacles. It's part of what she does. Anyhow, so Herb has this theory about performance, one of the universals of performance, and it has to do with death. And Julie Taymor really takes exception to this. So I thought I'd read to you a, a conversation between Clark Lunbury, who was a friend of mine in graduate school, who was also a student of Herb's, and Julie Tamor. And uh, Clark says to Julie, he says, uh, it's true, Herb would frequently return us to the actor whom he would say is dying in front of, our, in front of your eyes. That is one of his most well-known and repeated ideas, what he calls a universal of theater, that the actor is there dying in front of your eyes. Tamar asks, why does he say that the actor is dying in front of your eyes? Clark says, it's the actor's mortality that is present, and it's that which is being performed, that the actor is in time, and so time is present, and that mortality is what is being witnessed. And Tamar goes, this is the part of Herb that doesn't really, I just think, oh, come on already. The actor is living in front of your eyes. They are living and creating. They are not dying. I would say that dying would be if they were just standing there and nothing was happening. But if they're actually creating, they're living. Herb's view is a negative one. 
Right, so you see that tension. It just kind of goes on with that for a while, and then the interview ends abruptly. <laughs> but um, but there you go. Herb's right. Herb's right. You go to a play. There's that live actor. That actor is dying in front of your eyes. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. That is what's taking place. And I always thought that Herb brought that up, that he gave us that inflection. Because most of us, when we go see live theater, don't, you know, we don't think of it as death theater. We don't go, yeah, uh, we're, I'm going to go watch somebody die. You know, you go because there's a live performer. So I always thought Herb was trying to emphasize the thing we overlook in the experience of life, of live theater. But Julie Tamar is right as well. That person is alive right there. They're performing. The problem is you can't separate those two. Herb and Julie Tamar, they're each taking these extremes, performers dying, performers living. And they want to peel that apart. You know, one of the things I, I was thinking of uh, that might help with this is, you know, when we watch a movie, for example, in the olden days, now we've got digital presentations, but when we were watching film, there's a film strip and it's a bunch of still images. And the way that the image is projected, like the strip moves, and then there's a trap that kind of creates a flickering effect that makes it look like there's a, a, a sort of a stable image that's moving around in a little box. That box would be the screen. It looks like it's moving around. But what was really happening is there's an image that came before it, and there's an image that's yet to come that are constantly moving through it. If you didn't have that flickering effect, all you'd see is just blur or just be a stream. That's all it would be. But we've got this sense that there's this solid image right there, and that stuff is moving around in it. But what's really happening is the last frame is gone. It's gone. It's dead. It just died. That last frame just died. It just got out of the picture, and another one's being born is coming into the picture. And that dies. And it, the next one comes in, and it's constantly that. It's constantly coming in and going, and coming in and going, and coming in and going, and coming in and going, coming in and going, coming in and going. Coming in and, going. and it looks like this. Here we are, and there are these things, and they're moving around. Right? That is what makes this alive. That's what life is. They say living and dying. You say birth and dying. At each moment, just happening, you just almost say simultaneously. Because the reason I say almost say is that, again, we're, you, you could say it, but it's not really quite what's taking place. But it gives you a sense of what's going on here. So what's happening is the actor living in front of your eyes or dying in front of your eyes. Well, I suppose it just depends on how you parse that, doesn't it? I encountered this idea in a slightly different way. I've recently been reading a book called The Five Invitations. Discovering What Death Can Teach Us About Living, Finally. And that's by uh, Frank Ostaseski. I don't know if that's how he pronounces his name. Interesting book. So I've been reading this book, and it's uh, one of the things that's interesting about the book is it's, it's, uh, it's a Buddhist book. It's definitely like Buddhist teachings. It's filled with it. So it's really quite wonderful. And it does it in the context of, of um, dying. Frank Ostaseski was the founder of Zen Hospice out in, uh, in San Francisco. So he'd been, I think, a member of the San Francisco Zen Center and then started this, this hospice program. And so he talks a lot about his experiences in hospice and he brings a lot of Buddhist teachings in. So what's interesting about the book is I showed it to my husband. I said, does this look like a Buddhist book to you? Because it, it just has like watercolored lines on it. And then it just says the five invitations, discovering what death can teach us about living fully. And then I looked at the blurbs. You know, the blurbs are the way that the bookseller is trying to sell the book to you. Buddhism doesn't get mentioned at all. And then I read the description of the book, and Buddhism isn't mentioned at all, which is kind of surprising to me. So then I went back, and there's like two pages of blurbs. And I read all of the blurbs in the two pages, and Buddhism is mentioned in one just in one. <laughs> I just thought it was really interesting. So it's an interesting book in many ways, but I really like it. And I wanted to read this passage. It's a touching moment between Asta Seski and his son, Gabe. So this is what he says. Uh, so Asta Seski 
realizes he needs to have open heart surgery, might have had a heart attack, I think. He says, um, before I had open heart surgery, my son Gabe, who was in his late 20s at the time, visited me in the cardiac care unit of the hospital. We fell into a tender conversation, reminiscing about our relationship. Our sharing was filled with love, kindness, and laughter. At one point, Gabe stopped talking and became quite serious. Dad, are you going to live through this surgery, he asked. Now, I love my son beyond words. And so, like any father, I wanted to reassure him that, of course, I would live. I'd be just fine. I felt into my experience before answering. But I paused for a moment, searching for the right response. I felt into my experience before answering. Then I heard myself say, I'm not taking sides. <laughs> I'm not taking sides. My answer surprised us both. What I meant was that I wasn't taking sides with life or death. Either way, I trusted that everything would be okay. I don't know where the words came from. They spilled from me without censorship. I wasn't, a try I wasn't trying to appear sage or to be a good Buddhist. Yet we both were reassured by my response. I think it was because we knew we were in the presence of the truth spoken with love. I just love it. I'm not taking sides. I almost called my talk that. I'm not taking sides. It's a really tender moment. And Ostaseski is really trying to be as honest with his son as possible. And we can hear that I'm not taking sides as he's just not going to make a prediction on this. We're going into an uncertain situation, getting back to that uncertainty. Life is uncertainty, deeply uncertain, especially when we want certainty. Are you going to make it out of this alive or not, as son asks? And he wants comfort. And the father just can't say. He can't say what's going to happen. But even more than that is he won't take sides, life or death. That's what we want to do. Is this alive or is this dead? Is this threatening to me or is this, you know, what, however we want to look at it. But which captures reality? So Asta Seski, on one hand, didn't want to kind of call it in advance. All bets are off. <laughs> but at the same time, it was that he didn't want to take sides, life or death. Just what, what's going to happen is what's going to happen. What's going to happen is what's going to happen. And I really appreciate the fact that when it came out, both Ostaseski and his son were actually comforted by the truth of it. There's a lot of discussion in this book about truth in dying, rather than trying to shellac it with rosy feelings. Uh, Ostaseski's had a very funny story about an old, uh, older Jewish woman, and she was dying. She was in that part of her life where she was going to pass away. And um, she had a hospice nurse that was really meant well and was trying to, this woman was very upset. And uh, the woman who was dying. And so the hospice worker just said something like, it's okay. I'm here with you. And then the, <laughs> the woman shot back. She goes, that's fine for you to say you're not the one that's dying. If you were the one who was dying, you wouldn't be saying that. Uh, and I don't remember the other thing she said that was, was very funny. It was, and it was funny because you could tell that woman did not want bromides at that point. She didn't want somebody to tell her, it's okay. It's okay. She wanted the truth. Are you going to make it through the surgery alive? And then you could go, That's, the odds are good. Then you come up with the story. That's not what we're really looking for. We really want the truth which is not certain, does not have that certainty to it. And this brings me to, if you'll indulge me, I'm going to share with you a koan. I, that's, that's the indulgence. I know it's not people's favorite form necessarily, but this is a koan that had spoken to me when I first read it. I always think of this when I think about terms of living and dying. And I've seen a couple different versions of it. I'm getting this from Dogen's Treasury of the Dharma Eye, his collection of 300 koans. And it's titled Dao Wu 
Dao Wu won't say. So Jian Yuan Zhang Jing once accompanied his teacher Dao Wu on a condolence call to a family funeral. When they arrived, Jian Yuan tapped the coffin and said, is this life or is it death? And Dao Wu said, I won't say life, I won't say death. And Jian Yuan said, why won't you say? Dao Wu said, I won't say, I won't say. On their way back, Jian Yuan said, you should quickly say it for me or I will hit you. Da Wu said, hit me if you will, but I will not say. But Jin Yuan hit him. <laughs> After returning to the monastery, Da Wu said to Jian Yuan, you should leave for a while. I'm afraid if the head monastic finds out about this, he will make trouble for you. <laughs> Think about that student hitting the teacher. I can say. <clears throat> And in some ways, that's like uh, Dharma combat, which Dharma combat is like people socking one another. But it's just another way of the student saying, I'm asking you a question, I want an answer. And the teacher's answer is, I won't say, but the student's not hearing that. Back and forth, back and forth. So the hitting is part of the challenge to kind of get the teacher to say, because he's not hearing what the teacher's saying. Teacher's saying, I won't say. So anyhow, then we have, after Da Wu passed away, Jian Yuan went to see Da Wu's successor, Shishuang Kingzhu. He told him the story and asked for guidance. Shishuang said, I won't say life. <laughs> I won't say death. Jin Yuan said, why won't you say it? What do you think Shishuang said? I won't say it. I won't say it. <laughs> and Jin Yuan immediately realized it. You see, in this struggle, life or death, which, which is this? Knocking on that coffin. Is it life or is it death? I won't say life. I won't say death. The teacher's not being coy. That's this reality. What is this? What is this? Is it alive? Is this life? Is this death? I won't say. Because to say either way is to go astray. To say either way is to get caught up in the argument that Herb and Julie Taymor are caught up in. The actor's dying before your very eyes. The actor's living before your very eyes. That splits it out. Then we start arguing, start fighting about it. I won't say is the truth because in this moment, this moment that we think is a solid thing, is impermanent. That's its life. It's impermanent. Nothing stays here. The frame's always going. The next one's always coming in. You know, that's it. That's this. There's always fading and arising. That's how it appears to us. Right? There's just this, the awareness of it. That is the thing that does not come and go. That's what we can settle into and see the nature of this. <laughs> what that is, for what it is. We can't say life or death because to say it is to layer this that can't be said, this that is always here, this that isn't being born and dying. That's this awareness that is this reality. It's thus, I ask you, what happens after death? Well, it just keeps going, doesn't it? It just keeps going, stuff keeps happening. That's this. So does that mean no death? Well, we know things die all the time. They die all the time. Memories die. And sometimes, thank goodness, memories die. <laughs> there are things we don't want to remember. We're built that way. We're built not to remember everything. It'd be impossible. So we can't say one way or the other. Won't say life, won't say death. And Jin Yuan really wanted to nail that down. Living in uncertainty, that's difficult for us. We don't like not knowing. And really think about it. How often do you like throwing yourself into a situation where you don't know? Sometimes people do for fun. You know, I don't know what's going to go on here. This would be exciting. This would be an adventure. 
what the heck? <laughs> Every moment is like that if you're paying attention. Again, we don't think that it is because we might be in a situation where we can make a pretty good guess about what's going to happen next. But we don't know. We really don't know what's going to happen. Each moment, it's always fresh, always new, even when it looks familiar to us. But that sense of not being certain, of not knowing, it's uncomfortable, especially when it gets to the serious stuff, you know, the stepping into an uncertain situation, not knowing. It can be maddening. I said that at the beginning of the talk, it can be very maddening, not knowing what the answer is. You just want to get the answer. Just give me the answer. Just like that student. Now, come on, alive or dead, I won't say, I won't say. I'm going to hit you if you don't tell me. All right. And he doesn't, he doesn't hear. He does not hear. Because again, he's not really paying attention to what the teacher's telling him until years later. And he hears the teaching again. Same thing, alive or dead. I won't say alive, I won't say dead. Why won't you say it? I won't say it, I won't say it. And then, then he sees. He says he immediately realized that this can only be realized. That we can't be certain about it. The, the only certainty we have is in the realization of it. But we can't have that intellectual certainty, right? That is at the heart of certainty and uncertainty. So, for example, I wouldn't have known a song was going to be playing during my talk. <laughs> right there. But that's it. There it was. You know, so what do you do about that? Um, when I was... a uh, an undergraduate at the University of Minnesota, I took a class. It was one of my theater classes. Can you tell I was a theater major? <laughs> I'm always going on about theater. And it was intro to theater. Did anybody take intro to theater at the University of Minnesota? Ah, geez, you missed out. So when I, when I took it, uh, it was taught by a guy named Arthur Ballot. And he was, a, he was a, a dramaturg and he was also a theater director and he was a theater professor, and, and he was also locally, if you watch Channel 5 News, I think he, that was where he was. He was a film critic as well. But anyhow, he was just oozed charm, you know, and he would get up and he would tell us stories about the theater. And they were remarkable, just great stories about the theater. These, these wonderful images. And he was just a great teacher, taught well through lecturing. And um, anyhow, what would happen, though, is he'd be lecturing. And then there'd be a student, and Roger, you probably remember this from when you were teaching. Sometimes students don't always pay attention. <laughs> so there'd be like a student, he'd have his newspaper out, and Arthur Ball would be talking. And you, tell the guy sitting next to you to stop reading his newspaper. You know, he would like do that. He'd like point to point at people. And uh, anyhow, so what, uh, what Arthur would do is he would just kind of stop the whole thing and correct it get it back on schedule again. So he didn't like the fact that students weren't paying attention. And so uh, when I had him, he was a fairly old gentleman. I, actually, my husband's aunt went to the University of Minnesota like in the, uh, let's see, when did that have been? Late 50s, early 60s. She had Arthur, Arthur Ballot. I had Arthur Ballot in the early 80s. And she said, you had Arthur Ballot as a professor? He was already old when I took classes. <laughs> I mean, one of those things, he just taught for years. So. He had a backlog of lectures. And when I had him, he was old enough that he was going to get back surgery all the time. And so when he was getting back surgery, they would just show videos of his talks. And he'd be in the middle of a talk. And, Tell that guy next to you to stop reading the newspaper <laughs> right in the middle of his talk. You know, so, so how do we deal with what it is that's showing up? You just realize it. What, what is it that's taking place? And that's, again, what Zazen is. Zen is, Zazen is just realizing this. That's all it is. Nothing else. When we think it's something else, when we think it's the train that'll take us to the land of deathlessness, wow, it's taken me there. I no longer, you just notice that you're, you've got a concept about what this is and come back to the practice of Zazen, which is just realizing this this right here. And this shows up as all these things coming and going, but it's always just this. It's always just this. 
That is freedom from death. And I have one little stinger at the end. Do you understand? <laughs> so I think I'm going to uh, stop at that point. I don't know if people have questions or comments. Yes, yeah, Sumit. First, I just want to, I really appreciate the talk. There was one statement that you said early on, almost in passing, that just kind of kept ringing through my head. You said death is a mind object. Uh, Could you expand upon that? Sure. Anything is a mind object. So anything, all phenomena are mind objects. They're, they are mind, which is just, you could say, awareness or this consciousness. You know, it's, uh, but they are just what shows up. So we make them into things thinking they're separate from reality. There are these objects then, and then we fixate on them, but they're just the workings of mind. And so when we treat them as objects, as things that are separate, that's when they do what I talked about. If we can see through that sense we have of them having a solid existence, if we can understand that that is just something we're layering on top of it, and get to be open to, I say the emptiness of it, but it is really just sort of realizing and again, you could do this intellectually, though you're still in the realm of ideas, but you can see that anything that shows up is really intimately connected with everything else, everything else. You know, so I'm sure you've done exercises like that. I know I saw a art, a work of art where they took like a, a car engine apart and then they labeled where each tiny little part in that car engine came from was from all over the world. And that's just the world. And then you think about minerals and what the minerals represent and you can start going back through time and then all of that involves life other life that's arising and dying so maybe the fuel that it took to create the uh, the fuel that was used to create the heat to forge the metal you know was created from the remains of dying creatures and you can just start to see everything's all connected and that mind object starts being this, stops being this separate thing. And instead there's this field of awareness. Mm -hmm. There's just awareness of what's showing up and we don't get caught up in that object. So that's what I was talking about. Mind object is just whatever's showing up. That's mind object. And we can do one of two things, make a thing out of it and grab hold of it, or just sort of let it arise and cease of its own accord. Now I say that, and it's not like we walk through life as zombies. <laughs> you know, we have to, pick things up, um, but we, we want to watch being caught in our ideas about what this is. You know, we start thinking about things as separate. Um, we don't think about the impact of what it is that we're doing. And uh, yeah, I guess I can leave it at that. Does that uh, address what your question was? I won't say. <laughs> <laughs> Very nice. You're getting there, <laughs> which is here. <laughs> the, and I don't know if there's a real question here, but kind of like the thought that I was having during this talk, I, I, I'm thinking about people that I know that are sick and people that I've known who are sick and the way they've approached death. And I've seen people approach death as this grand fight against it. Mm -hmm. And I'm asking myself, what is this grand fight? Like, what are they fighting? And like, what comes to mind for me is they're fighting a continuous, a sense of a continuous sense of self, right? And so you're talking, I feel like one of the things I've heard is you're saying, like, pay attention, death is happening all the time. But through these many, de many deaths of life, there's a continuous sense of self that can somehow navigate its way through. And what, what it seems like we struggle with is, well, these mini deaths, there's something with, that's, there's some I that's going through them. But with the big finale, that big I isn't going to make it. And I, and I, I, don't, I don't know what the question is, but it seems like that's what we resist really aggressively. 
Yeah. Well, the experience, you know, as I was trying to show in my talk, you know, we have this awareness, we just have this. Yeah. It's continuous. Yeah. And then the things that kind of come and go in it, they're discontinuous. So reality has this continuous, discontinuous quality to it. Yeah. And that continuous quality to it, we attach to it and we call it I, me. Yeah. And that is, you're right, that's the thing. We're afraid that that's going to become discontinuous. And yet it sure seems like it was continuous. So yeah. there's that uncertainty. What the heck does this mean? We might not tell ourselves that's what's going on, but there is an uncertainty. What is this? This thing that seemed continuous, it's going to end. Yeah. And what does it mean for it to end? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And uh, yeah, Asta Seski talks about some people that they feel their mission is to fight death. Yeah. You know, what is the, the great Dylan Thomas poem? Do not go gentle into that good night. Rage, rage against the dying of the light. You know, that's uh, almost like a badge of honor to do that. And some people will, and some people won't. And that's just how it's showing up for them at that moment. You know, in, in the moment of death, I've been reading uh, plenty of books about it. And it certainly sounds like you let go of the things that you're hanging on to when you need to let go of them. And probably not before that. And before that, it might seem to those watching that it's pretty horrible, <laughs> you know, but it's just, that's the, that's the path. That's this. Oh, thank you. I heard on the radio yesterday that somebody has published a book called 100 Places to Visit After You Die. After you die. <laughs> and my response was, how the heck would he know what's appropriate? <laughs> That's a great title for a book. Uh, it's kind of a comment on what you were saying, Steve. I've, I've read lots of books about death. And recently, I, I don't know the name of it, but I read something I, I thought was very helpful. And it says, it said basically, when, and it really is calling it a mind thing. This book said, your body knows how to die. You don't, you don't have to know how to die once you agree to do it. And if, you know, if you've been like, I went 10 years straight to colleges and, you know, it seems like my whole life is getting ready to drive somewhere to know how to do it. But this, it's, so it's kind of help in the book when I'm, when I'm ready, my body knows exactly how to do it quickly and efficiently. So yeah. I actually think that's a nice thing to consider. Yeah, I pre appreciate that, Roger. Nice to see you again, by the way. Thanks. Yeah, um, no, uh, th I think that's, that's excellent. I've, I've encountered this in a number of books as well. And it just, that's one of those teachings that makes sense. Your, your body knows, you know, it, it just, you're going to know how to die. Every, as another person said, we've been doing it for a long time now. <laughs> you know, it's, uh, it's when we want to be certain, when we want to know, what is this? How do I do it? What is it? You know, what is it? You know, how do you, how do, you do this correctly? So there's another story that Asta Seski brings up that I myself have wondered, you know, over the years, I've heard people talk about dying, say a good death. And uh, he, he tells a story about a, a gentleman who was really, his body was very rigid, very rigid. And then it kind of freaked us to Seski out. And so he started contacting people with advice about what he could do to help this guy relax. And none of it worked. He tried all these things, but none of it worked. And then finally, he just settled into the moment and he uh, climbed onto the bed with the guy. It was a friend of his. Um, and sang a lullaby in his ear and was just making it up as he went along, hugging the guy. And that was it. And he said, eventually the guy sort of relaxed and he passed away. And uh, what Ostaseski realized was that the, the difficulty wasn't what the guy was going through. Again, you hang on to what you hang on to so you can't hang on to it. But it was the fact that everybody else thought that what was going on there was wrong. We know how to die. Let us do it. Yeah, so thanks for sharing that. I think that's a good teaching. That was, that was a good point. I like that a lot. And that was a pretty sweet talk, by the way. I like it. <laughs> I, uh, I had an interesting period of my life just a few months ago where I had three deaths that happened within two weeks. And I was there for two of them. 
And the thing you were talking about, about the, the film kind of flipping through. So <clears throat> when two of these people passed away, um, it was pretty trippy because I encountered them when they were both in a hospital. They saw me, I saw them. There was a moment of levity and like caring and things felt nice. And then boom, one person passed away as if he knew how to die because what made him pass away had nothing to do with what brought him into the hospital. I suspect in my head, when he saw that I was there, he was kind of like, okay, things are okay, I can go. And then boom, he was gone. And then a few days later, boom, she was gone. And it was pretty trippy because I was seeing it happen kind of real time and I had to be there and I saw the earthly remains that I kind of had to work with a little bit. And then it kept playing. So that all happened. And then I was like, well, I think I'm gonna go out for dinner and I'll bring a little picture and I'll put it on the table. And I had a margarita and some, and some uh, Mexican food because we used to go there a lot. And I was like, wow, so here this is. That happened and now here this is. And just uh, this morning uh, as I was up and having my coffee, I was like, huh, now this is here. And it was just this continuous play, you know what I mean? Yeah. And so that was cool. I liked your talk. It was really like, yeah, that's about right. And that's what I've seen. You know, that was it. Thanks for sharing, Andrew. Anything else? Well, great. Thank you. Thank you.